Welcome to The Simple Truth. Uh, the last few weeks I've been teaching on the blood and then on the anointing. And I, to be honest with you, I thought uh, last week program was going to be the end of the anointing, but, but the Lord's changed my mind in that. Um, to finish up, uh, so uh, we're still talking about the anointing. And as I've told you in past programs, you can't talk about the anointing without talking about the blood. And you can't talk about the blood without talking about the anointing. Uh, they are... Um, not the same, but they are so close together that the importance there uh, is very important. But today we're going to be looking at some of the scriptures that tells us more about the anointing and how we come into it and how we can, can grow uh, in that anointing by doing what the Lord has told us to do. And so today I want to start out in Matthew chapter 7. And I want to take a look at verses 7 and 8. They'll be familiar verses that, that you and I have, have heard preached, taught on. I myself have, have done both to teach on, and, and, but I'm going to go a little bit farther with you today. Verse 7, on chapter 7 of Matthew, verse 7 and 8, and it says, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. So here we, we have a picture of prayer that we've, we've been taught, <clears throat> that we ask and keep on asking. We seek and keep on seeking, and, and we knock and keep on knocking until we get the answer. Uh, it, it is a part of the prayer, and it is something that works, and, and, and probably you and I both know that it works. We have done this. But I want to take you a little bit deeper. When talking about the anointing, it's one thing to ask for your prayers to be answered. It's another thing to seek for those things to be happening, and then to knock until it's open. But there's a step we need to do before that. And so I want you to back up to chapter 6 of Matthew and verse 33. And it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and all of his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So you see, sometimes we, we, we bypass this part, which is, I'm thinking that one of the most important parts of this, that Jesus was teaching us about um, what we were to drink, what we were to eat, um, what we close our clothes with. And he was telling about how he, he closed the fields and, and, and feeds the birds and, and all. And we're so much more to him than those things. And so then he says, you know, in verse 31, he says, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? God knows we need those things. And it's okay to pray for those things. But I want to take you a little deeper into the anointing here. And it says, but he knows we know those, we need those things. He knows we have earthly needs that we have here that, to sustain us, to take care of us. But he says, but seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. If we first seek his kingdom... And we look for him, and I, and I believe this is looking for the presence of God that we're looking for. He is, <clears throat> the, he, it is a kingdom, and he is in authority over it, <clears throat> but we are looking for the one who has the authority, and he is the one that we are seeking. So we're seeking after the presence of God, not just to know him, because in his presence we will learn what his character are, uh, his personality. Uh, we learn what his voice sounds like and the follow it. Uh, but it also not only gives us those things, but it gives us his perfect will. And once we know what his perfect will is, we find that in that perfect will, we find that we have found uh, our will in the midst of it. Now, I want you to understand that that. I try through the best of my ability to listen to what God is trying to tell me to, for these programs or if I'm in the pulpit or, or if I'm teaching somewhere. I always try to listen to what he wants me to do because uh, let's face it, if I told you what I wanted to say, 
you would get nothing out of it. It wouldn't be anointed. It would just be something, to be words. But when you follow into his anointing, then it's his words and his power that is, that is bringing life to it. You see, we need to have the Holy Spirit uh, working in us for this to happen. Now, <clears throat> how do we get into this place? Well, first we need to come through uh, salvation, which is about the blood. Jesus willingly sacrificed his life for you and I. And once we have accepted that forgiveness and we are covered by his blood and we're talking spiritually, I'm not talking about pouring it over us or anything like that, then we also at the same time we are anointed. Now last week when I was talking about 1 John chapter 2 verse 27, he says that we are anointed. Now we are anointed under the anointing of Christ who is the head of the church. So we have those things. So we have that first step, that, that leopard's uh, anointing, which is salvation. And now here in this verse, this verse 33, we're looking for the presence of God to increase the anointing that is on your life and my life. If you're saved, you have the anointing. This is how we increase that anointing is by seeking him. We're learning his traits. We're learning about his presence and living, learning to live in that presence uh, as much as possible. And we do that by knowing him. And he says that's the first part. In his presence, we realize what his righteousness is, his right doing should be our right doing. That's righteousness. And he says, if you're doing these things, all these things will be added to you. What are the things he's talking about? All those things that we need, all those, those desires that we have that he's put on. So that now when we go back over to chapter 7 and we read, ask and it will be given to you and seek and you will find and knock and it will be opened, we find out that we've already sought him. It is the idea of seeking the blesser and not the blessings. Okay? We sometimes bypass looking for the blessings and forget who the blesser is. And so we need to be looking at that part. Now, what we're talking about is, is that continual relationship that we have in Christ for the anointing to work through our lives. Now, I want you to go to Acts. I want to show this in a special way in Acts chapter 19. And this is kind of a, a backwards way of putting it. But, but um, <clears throat> Paul was doing some spectacular miracles that God was doing through Paul. God was doing them, but they were through Paul's hands. And even if they was a, a napkin or an apron taken from him and laid on someone that was sick, they would be healed. Or if they had a demon, <clears throat> an evil spirit, they would be cast out. And so there was Jews at the time who was doing this kind of exorcism that was going on. And then we have, uh, and they was doing it the way Paul was, in the name of Jesus that Paul preaches. Now, that should give you an indication of what's wrong with, these, with this picture. Now, on <clears throat> verse 14, Acts chapter 19, verse 14, also they were seven sons of Sevius, a Jewish chief priest who did so. So here's Seven sons of a chief priest in Ephesus that was doing these, these things that Paul was doing. In verse 15, And an evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. This was made known both to the Jews and the Greeks dwelling in Ephesus. And fear fell upon them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. For many who had believed came confessing and telling their deeds. So you see that there was a, in this, in this a revival broke out afterwards. But look at what it says. Jesus I know. This is a, I usually don't like bringing out what 
a demon would say. But here he's saying, Jesus I know. Demons, evil spirits, however you want to call them, they recognize the authority of Jesus Christ in, is over them. It is over them. He has more power than them. And so they recognize that. And then he says, Paul I know. Now wait a minute. We know Jesus is God, but Paul's not. He's a man, a human, just like you and me. But the difference is, the demon recognized the authority that Paul has because of his relationship with Jesus. And that he has been obedient in that relationship to do what the things God had called him to do. So you see, now we see that, that there is a relationship that's going on here. There is a continuing relationship. It's not just... I got saved, now I do what I want to. It is a continued relationship with Christ that makes the anointing to grow. And it is obedience that helps make it grow so that we can do more. And the Lord is with us and blessing us. And then when it says, but who are you? Looking at these seven men, who are you? Now, I want you to understand they were the sons of of the chief priests. So they had religion. They had, uh, you know, what was being given to them in the synagogue. But there was no relationship with Jesus Christ. He was only a name to them. He was only a historical figure to them. There was no relationship, and therefore they had no authority and no power, and the demon shows what happens when you have no relationship and no power. That demon wasn't going to mess with Jesus, and he wasn't going to mess with Paul, but these seven guys had nothing to stand on. So through this backdoor, you know, anti-example, we find out that it is the anointing that works in our lives, but it is through Christ Jesus that it comes into and that it works in us. Now, I want to go back to Luke chapter 4. And bring out again what I, what I talked about last week. <clears throat> and where Jesus is in the synagogue and they've handed in the book of Isaiah. And he looks for the place in the scripture where it says this, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, and he has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and to recover the sight to the blind, and to set liberty to those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So here we see that Jesus of himself is talking about what Isaiah prophesied before him, uh, before Jesus came on earth. He's always been, he always was, always will be, and, and, and continue into eternity. But it says he, God the Father, has anointed, has, uh, has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. The good news to the poor of salvation. That's the good news here. That is what's being preached. And he's backing it up by signs and wonders that he's doing. He has set, sent me to heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me that are in... Maybe it's brokenhearted from a loss of a loved one. Maybe it's brokenhearted of the way the things are. You know, the Romans are in charge of the country. They are brokenhearted because of the occupation. Uh, there could be other situations that they could be brokenhearted about. They could be worrying about. And yet, he's saying, I've come to heal the brokenhearted. I am to bring comfort to you who are brokenhearted in the sense of setting you free. Uh, he said, I proclaim liberty to the captive. I'm given freedom, and that's not freedom to do whatever we want to, 
but given freedom to the captives. And I want you to understand, he's not just talking about those that were confined to a prison in a cell. He's also talking about those who are worried about anything else. Okay, um, money, you know, where your next meal coming from, um, all those kind of things that we can be in bondage to. There are some people that makes a lot of money, and yet they are in bondage to it because they keep thinking they have to make more, that, that this is not enough. I want you to understand that with Christ, everything's enough, and it's all, you know, we can be set free from those worries. Uh, to recover the sight of the blind. He's talking about healing. Not only blindness of, of spirit and not seeing who he is and how much he loves us, but also that we can be, be physically healed by what God is doing in our lives because of what he's come to do. And that anointing, as I told you in the past, flows over us too because Jesus is the head of the church. Uh, to be set at liberty those who are oppressed, those that are in bondage, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. He is saying that this year is the acceptable year. Actually, this time, this moment, is the acceptable year to accept the Lord. It is that much that he said, I'm giving you the opportunity. Now, I want you to understand that, that when I was thinking about this particular part, I kept receiving that in the Old Testament when they was... Uh, anointing Aaron, the high priest, they anointed him one way, and that was the pouring the oil over the top of him, over the, the uh, turban and the crown and over the, the high holy priest's garments, and it dripped down over his head and his beard and the clothing and, and off onto the floor. Um, so there was a lot of oil there, but he's the only one that was anointed that way. He was later anointed with his sons with the blood being put on his right ear and um, this side, his right ear, his uh, right big thumb, and his right big toe. And then the oil was applied to those three places, as, uh, denoting that we are to hear God. As Jesus is telling us that his sheep will hear his voice. It talks about the works of our hands with the thumb that we are anointed and, and saved through Christ, through those things, but also the big toes, which shows that where we are going, the ministry that we are doing, wherever we go, God is anointing for us to go. But then we have to go back to verse 33 in chapter 6 of Matthew and say, I need to seek the kingdom first. I need to seek God first so that all these things will be added on. I want to know who God is and His will is, and that increases the anointing and His righteousness. And when I know more about God, I know about this is His will. This is what God would do. You remember the few years ago when we had the bracelets that uh, was, you know, what would Jesus do? It's that kind of mindset that we're talking about here. Once we know what His will is, once we know what His personality is, once we understand what His will would be, then when He tells us to do certain things, we can say, yep, that's His will. You know, many times when, when I hear the Spirit speak to me, I know who it is by the characteristic of what's being said and of who's, been, who's saying it. And we need to test those things. So uh, he's telling us these things so that we can do them and walk in them. You know, um, talking about the anointing, there have been cases in my life that, that amazes me, okay? Um, as a pastor, um, uh, he taught me very early in my ministry that, that it wasn't about what I prepared, but what he prepared. Um, I was sitting on the platform while the offering was being received, and I heard the, now whether it was an audible, I doubt if it was an audible voice, I think it was an inner spiritual voice that God spoke to me and said, uh, you seen the verse on the back of the bulletin? That's what I want to preach on. And I said, well, but I prepared this. And he said, back of the bulletin, preach on that. 
And I said, but Lord, I've prepared this, you know. And the third time he said, are you going to do what you prepared or what I prepared? And I said, Lord, I'm going with you. And on a verse that, that I recognized and, and knew something about, not everything, but preached for 30 minutes on that verse, and it was the anointing of God, not me. It was the anointing that that verse needed to be preached to these people that was there. I personally believe that we should seek him and find out what is to be spoken before we ever go to a pulpit before we ever start teaching. Uh, they, I have spent times as a pastor that at midnight on Saturday night, he's given me five verses and then told go to bed. And I thought, Lord, I, I need to study these, you know, so I could, you know, and he said, go to bed. And I did. And the next morning I preached on it. Uh, I have walked into my church and not had a clue what God was going to have me preach on, if anything, you know, if God didn't show up, we'd go home early, <clears throat> and still, uh, at the last moment, he would bring in what needed to be said, and it's more important for me, and it should be more important for you, that we hear what God says from the pulpit, and not just from a good speaker. Okay, I believe that wholeheartedly, and, and, and that's where I go back to verse 33, and I say, this is, this is what God has taught me to do. This is how I've got to do it. The same way I have to start out teaching, and if he turns it to preaching, that's up to him. I have to do what I know what, what he's got me doing. And so we see those things happening, but that's the anointing working in our lives, and it works in your life too. But are you willing to step out of it? This is, this is where I've told uh, people in the past that when you step out on the anointing, it is like you're standing on the limb and you're sawing it off at the trunk. You have to have, you know, the faith to say, <laughs> okay, this is what you want. This is what we're going to do. Now, it's not that drastic at times. It can be just as simple. And, and I want you to understand that there have been times in my life that it was afterwards that someone has come to me and said, that was anointed. Oh, <laughs> okay. Thank you, Lord. Uh, there have been, been times that I have looked back over a sermon or a message or a teaching and thought, wow, I have... Watch this program that, that I do at times. And, and at the end of the program, thought, did I say that? No. God said that through me. Just like Paul was doing these miracles through other people, through Paul. And he can do it through you, and he can do it through me. But we have to be willing, and we have to seek him for those things that we do just at the right moment, just at the right time that God anoints in our lives. I have seen times, I, I'll give you a couple examples. Uh, one was there was a young lady that had been hurt in a motorcycle accident at a young age, and one of her arms didn't work quite up to par. I'll put it that way. And, and in church on one Sunday morning, she played her keyboard, and when she got done, there wasn't a dry eye in the house because of knowing that it was anointed. Was, did she always do that great? No. But that morning, that time, the anointing came on her, and we as a congregation was blessed. I can tell you of a time when there was a gentleman in our congregation that played the guitar. Uh, was he a great guitar player? No. Uh, did he have a great voice? No. But one morning he said, Pastor, I have this song. I'd like to sing it this morning. And I said, okay, because I want to encourage my people to step out in faith to be a blessing. You can see at times on a person's heart that they want to be a blessing. 
and it's from the heart. And so I said, sure, go ahead. I'll let you know when it is. And when he got up and he played his guitar and he sang his song, we were amazed because of the blessing that we received from the anointing that was on him for this particular moment. And I want you to understand that there's times like that that we know that God has touched a person and they have done something from their heart and you know that they've been with the Lord to bring that about. It is about knowing Christ in a personal way. It is about following Him in a completeness uh, without failing, without knowing maybe where you're going, without knowing everything that's supposed to happen. It, it just has a way of touching people's lives and anointing them in a way that you and I are blessed. They were blessed by the Word, and we are blessed by His anointing that comes on a person that gives us what God wants to say to our hearts and not what a man says. I want you to understand that the finding the anointing that we all have and how it's supposed to be used is to know Jesus Christ personally. If you seek Him first, He'll take care of everything else because you're trusting Him, you're following Him, and you're showing your love towards Him. And the deeper you walk with Christ, the stronger the anointing is, and the stronger that you'll have faith in Christ because it all works together to bring out God's love and touching one another. And it is important for us to know that it's through the blood that we're saved. It is through Christ's obedience that we are anointed and that you and I have a place in the church for that anointing to be used as God says. Seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. Follow Him. God bless you. And we'll see you next week.